Alright, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We got ourselves a little bit of musical hype. We got ourselves a game hype. We got ourselves a game five. George Mason versus Texas A&M. We have gone through the gauntlet. We have gone through the craziness. We've gone through the team fight heavy game one and two. We've gone through the slow burn through game number three and the quick just smash in game number four. What are we going to get today in game number five? That's the question. I am absolutely hyped. Prince, how are you doing? Please tell me you are just crazy hyped for this as well. I am so hyped to be casting my first fifth game in the best of five. I am super excited to see what both of these teams pull out and to see if the... Uh, oh my god, I am blank so hard. <laughs> to see hard. if Texas A&M can finish out the series with a reverse sweep and actually close it out. Or if George Mason will come back from their mental boom in game number four. They are hovering the Lucian pick and I want to talk about it to see what they do here. Well, we'll talk about it in just a second, but exactly as you said, this is game five. This is all the marbles. Texas A&M have won the last two. They are riding high. They got to feel so good. But for GMU, they know that after two easy, or not easy, but two good wins, two solid games from game one and two, they've got to pull out something for this game five. They got to do something. So expect to see them 100% all in. There is no surrendering this one. There is no giving up. There is no taking a break. It is all all in all the way and Ion doesn't lock in the Lucian as the first pick he goes for the Jarvan giving Lucian over to Texas A&M Krushna popped off on the Ezreals and the Kaisa can he do it now on the Lucian that is hype and if I am on the side of George Mason maybe you hover the Lucian pick as like a Hey, look at this pick that we did really bad on. You try to take it. Let's see <laughs> if you can make it work. Because here's the thing. With how these teams play, I don't think that George Mason has the strategy to execute the Lucian pick. But Texas A&M, with the amount of teleports they take, especially on their solo laners, always having double TPs, they can execute a Lucian comp well. Oh my god, it's there. It's back. Hey, it's back, Jake. Oh. It's the Galio pick. It won game one, game two. And George Mason was like, we don't need it. It it's could bad. win game three. They got the Ezreal as well. Enrique going to enjoy that champion a little bit more. Now, I do got to say, the Lucian didn't actually do that badly last game. Enrique and Rylas combining the Lucian and the Karma did fairly well, poking out the enemy champions, making sure they got some fairly decent lane dominance. It was when the J4, when the jungler of Zest just absolutely smashed them coming into that bottom lane again and again. Fantastically done, giving over Texas A&M such an advantage in that bottom lane. But as you say, that Galio was a critical factor. Game one and game two for those wins. He disappeared for who knows what reason. It wasn't banned, just wasn't picked. Game three and four. Now he's showing up game five. Can the Thresh Lucian pairing from Texas A&M take him down? We'll have to see. For the bands, I most they most likely will stay the same. The big thing I do want to note is that George Mason actually can ban out the jungle pool here. They can ban out champs like that Sejuani that's been pretty much just going back and forth between which jungler does play in this series mm -hmm. and has been a pretty much staple pick for the series. Uh, I was mentioning how I think that Tex A&M actually can play the Lucian pick better. I think George Mason played a really good Lucian pick. Like they had a solid lane and they were getting, uh, they got actually one tower planning. It's just when everything on the map is crumbling around you, I don't think that Texas that George Mason's team is built around Enrique. He is a phenomenal player. He can play out light, late game team fights fantastically. But the focal point of that team is Anime Lover and Firefly and Ion. They are the players that set up the team fights so that Enrique can be in the back lines throwing in damage with chip picks like the Ezreal and like the Sivir. So when they do pick Enrique and Rylas to have that advantage in the lane with Lucian and Karma, it's just do I think that those players can execute that comp? Do I think George Mason can execute that comp? And game number four showed me that they can't. For Texas A&M, Kushna has been the carry for the team. Anytime you see T Texas A&M win, it's Kushna getting quadra kills, getting mm -hmm. so much damage off in these team fights, and his laners will roam to help out this lane. 
We've seen multiple times double TP coming down, Vladimir's coming down, Kennen's <laughs> coming down. They will execute, and that is going to be a Gragas jungle for game number five. The first time we've seen in the series could be the pick for Z3SS. Oh, I love it. I want to see Zest do it. He's played a pretty good Jarvan, but one of the great things about the Gragas is you don't need to go all in. You just need to be in position to throw that explosive cast. Bring the party to your team. Thresh able to make some nice plays with the play off of that. They still don't have a really solid frontline tank. The Holy Slurp might need to lock that in for Kratius in... No, hold on. That's a Ken in the top lane. Gragas mid. I'm curious to see what mid laner they pick as Lissandra's already been banned away. But for the side of GMU, they're still trying something new. This time, though, in a different lane. They've got Aatrox and hovering the Elise. I really like that Elise pick for themselves. No, Ooh, they're going to switch it over to the Nocturne. Nocturne. I think I would have liked Elise a little bit better. But Nocturne's still nice for the engage. Look at their comp, though. Where is the AP? Where's the magic damage? They have no AP, but goddamn is Galio, Nocturne, and Jarvan the scariest backline dive I've seen in a long time. That is so much damage that Lucian is going to have to contest with in this backline. And if Crocious can't be... Crocious, this game is going to have to be a bodyguard. And they actually end up picking up the Orianna. And so I'm so excited for these comps and how they're going to work out. Because... For the side of Texas A&M, you have Kennen and Orianna that need to buy space to get Lucian to deal a lot of the damage. And you have Gragas and Thresh as his bodyguards. The amount of zone control that Kennen and Orianna offer is so much, but if Nocturne can get ahead, if Firefly can get ahead and get the item advantage in his, as he's jungling, Nocturne, Jarvan, Galio is so strong in terms of the dive, and Aatrox can pretty much be that fourth diver. Pops the ultimate, gets those three sweet spot cues. There's not enough tanky members on AM to pretty much disengage from that. I want to see how they play it out and how the carries for both of these teams do in game number five. Yeah, a lot of that peel going to be necessary from the Holy Slurp on this Thresh to keep the Lucian, even the Orianna, alive. Greg is also pretty good with that peel. A nice cast could send people. Flying backwards, as well as a body slam can interrupt Aatrox in the middle of those cues. There's some potential for stuff on the side of Texas A&M. However, you can't get a better Galio alt than Nocturne, who just simply says, you know what, I one-click follow you wherever you go. Feel free to flash. Feel free to Relentless Pursuit. Doesn't matter. I will follow you to the ends of the Runeterra to make sure that my Galio has an opportunity to alt in as well, get some knock up and CC. Now, what I want to see from GMU is please don't int into the enemy team jungle, give them three kills at the very beginning of the, the game, and just set yourself... Okay, we're not going to talk about game four. Uh, <laughs> just play it smart, play it safe, let Nocturne hit that level six. Really, they don't need to do anything crazy. They don't need to be looking for the crazy ganks. They don't need to be looking for the crazy lane plays. Other than maybe Ezreal and Galio having a little bit of fun in the bottom lane. They really just want to wait until Nocturne hits level 6. Jarvan can roam with his teleporter, looking for Cataclysm plays, and then start pulling out this insane wombo combo. Quick interesting note, that's an Aatrox in the mid lane versus Orianna. So Aatrox in the mid versus Ori is a kind of rough matchup for the Aatrox. He does get bullied out early on. Uh, I'm kind of surprised that Oriana actually didn't take the Ignite to have a little bit more early lane pressure. It does make sense though because she is against so much dive and that she definitely feels like she needs the uh, heal to get away from a lot of that. Early on, however, Aatrox is going to have a lot of issues because Aatrox's healing that used to be on his Q so that he could heal off minions so he could survive ranged matchups has been taken away. So now all of his healing pretty much comes from hitting champions. And if he doesn't hit the Orion and she can play safe enough and just harass him with the clockwork wind up autos, he's going to be in a world of trouble. The thing is, though, I did see that some members in Twitch chat mentioned the high amount of AD on the side of George Mason. For the side of George Mason, it is a lot of AD. They don't have a lot of AP threats. The only AP damage that's really going to come out is the Ezreal. The good thing, however, is that Texas A&M really don't really have tanks. Gragas most of the times goes for that uh, for the AP itemization jungle, and then he goes for a little bit of off tank. But he's not really the big tank. 
there's not a lot of tanky members on the side of AM, and the only armor items they should probably build will be the Zanias. So they are going to be decently squishy, and Lucian's going to have a lot of trouble dealing with the Nocturne Jarvan and Galio Dive because he's such a small and low range AD carry. If he walks up too far, he can always get Galio W Flash. He can always get engaged by Nocturne, and he just can't run far enough if Crocious and Mr. Black Panda aren't peeling for him. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, the locks are in. The choices are made. There is no turning back now. I am just absolutely going nuts over here, excited to see what these two teams can bring. Mr. Black Panda on the Orianna showed up huge. I believe it was in game number two. Feels good for him on that champion. Was that game two or game three? It doesn't matter. He knows how to play this champion, and he's got synergy with that Dark Star Thresh as well. Look at that. Everything seems to be going in favor of Texas A&M at the moment. But can they make the plays to follow through? It is game five. GMU taking on Texas A&M. Two wins to two wins. This is basically a full reset. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the best of one for this <laughs> Collegiate League of Legends playoffs game. These two teams have got to just put everything on the line. I mean, it really is. You got to play at your best and you can't go crazy, right? We had some craziness happening in game three and game four. You can't go crazy. You can't go crazy. You got to play cold. You got to collect yourself. You got to say, you know what? We're just gonna breathe and i think you're right that even though the surrender was sad to see in game four it kind of gave all the players a chance to say you know what that was just uh, that was a practice game that was a warm-up game now we're gonna play for reals yep sometimes even the best teams in the world like griffin can get just get blown out in a random game it's just what sometimes happens sometimes you make plays in the early game that don't end up going through and it's just okay they just need to have a mental reset on both teams. And for the Cytex A&M, they can't get up too overexcited. In the first two games, they were overeager. There were times where, again, you would see them just tower dive when they didn't need to. They would have advantage in team fights and then just throw away, playing a little bit too overaggressive. And now that they're actually on the winning side, but they have all of the momentum, they need to realize someone on that team needs to be saying, guys, we've won the last two games. We just need one more. Everyone just calm down. Play it smart, play it safe, we got this. Someone needs to be communicating that. And I think that they definitely could. We're not seeing any of those crazy inting into the enemy team's jungle. Both sides are playing safe. Now, Gragas is starting on his red side. Maybe he felt a little confident from last game being on that side of the map. So he's going to go ahead and take his red as Nocturne. He's going to start his blue. So junglers could make some things spicy if they both decide to come to the bottom lane around the same time. Keep our eye on these junglers, especially that Nocturne, wanting to hit that level 6 to make some plays. Gragas, level 2, can flash body slam and make some plays happen. I'm really curious to see how this Orianna, range champion into the Aatrox, does pretty good. But I forgot to mention this, if you're in the chat right now, first of all, welcome to XNC Shoutcasting. If you're supporting one of these teams, please hashtag them. Let us know who you're supporting, who you want to win this game. Because one of these teams is going to come out the winner at the end of it all. You only can have one, and one of these teams will walk away the victor of these playoff games. And it is really fun whenever games just boil down to that best of one. It's all or nothing, and I'm really happy that we ended up going to a best of five to the fifth game, because game, if it had been a 3-0 stomp, it wouldn't have shown how close these games were. Game number one, game number two, and game number three were so close for both teams, and they played so back and forth. Game number four was the anomaly in the series where it was pretty much just a blast. But all of those first games, they were so close by all of these teams that they played so goddamn well. Ooh, chains are gonna land for on the back for just a little bit of damage, but the poking has commenced. And so far, GMU's mid and top lane doing pretty well, shoving the Orianna and Kennen back a bit. However, CS not that far except for the Kennen, the top lane. Look at that, 6 CS to 18. Gracious, struggling this game. He's got a wave to catch up a little bit, but man, he is starting to lose out a pretty hefty amount. Gragas may need to pay a little attention up here on that top side. And I really like how Eon plays this Jarvan into Kennen matchup the second time he's playing at the series. He always takes this summon airy rune, and uh, it actually allows him to get a lot of poke off, and we never see him fall behind from CS. He always stays ahead or even, and he's 
he is the rock for this team on the side of George Mason. He always stays even, he always makes sure that he's doing what needs to be, and he's always a carry threat for the side of uh, George Mason. He may not decimate during the laning phase, but you can trust that he's not going to completely lose his lane. And you can see, he even went the Doran's ring as well to make sure that he's getting those Demacian standards down to just poke, poke, poke away on Cannon, which as a melee champion, Jarvan oh. doesn't have many options. However, that sentence will land onto the Ezreal. Well, the press he finds it. He's hooked in a nice play as well. Galio finds the taunt onto the Lucian. Where's he going? He's going to have to take the death or the dark passage to get out of danger. Which again, I feel like I'm behind you, so I'm going to speed up. Oh, there we go. Should be going pretty well now. And thank you, Extreme 66, with the single host. And we're into the pause. It's actually not possible to get through one of these games without a pause. Maybe, maybe, maybe they just wanted us to do a little bit more analysis. They said, you know what? You've only talked for about five minutes straight of these Ooh, this game. Ooh, quick pause. Okay, they felt bad for us. They, they weren't going to make us do too much. We're back in. Whew. Whew, you got to have the quick little uh, pause right at the start of the game. They have to get it in. They didn't get it in right at the start, so they had to get it in somewhere. Oh, you're right. You're right. Like, three out of the four previous games, the very beginning of the game was a pause. So most of you guys didn't get to see much or any of it because of the animations that we have here. But they said, you know what? You know what? We're going to go ahead and start a little bit of some pauses this game because we didn't get in at the beginning. And it looks and appears, according to the chat, like the support for GMU has DC'd. So Galio may be struggling just a little bit, and they'll go ahead and wait it out until he comes back. Get your pizza, get your water, or most likely soda, Mountain Dew preferably, and be ready because this game could explode at any minute once we get unpaused. One thing I want to talk about in terms of just as we have this pause, just talk about some of the small, minute details in some of these lanes. Uh, Oriana taking the Corrupting Pot start instead of maybe something like the Dorn's Ring or even sometimes playing aggressive enough the Dark Seal. I kind of don't agree with starting out with the Corrupting Pot. It is good in matchups where you think that you're going to get poked out and actually are losing, but when you have the range versus melee pressure, especially against champs like Aatrox who can't really deal from a wave anymore, not ha- Oh, what a good hook. Oh, even through the Arcane Shift, they're still going to fight him. The double top for the Galio. Hold on, Kashubi, forced to use the heal, has to escape, and now Rylat's going to be in trouble. A couple more auto attacks. He gets first blood over to Kashuda. He's doing a fantastic job, but now Anime Lover says, you know what, we got party in the bottom lane. Let's party in the mid lane. Drops the Oriana down. Down to about half. She's also fairly low on mana. So keep your eyes there. As Kratos is just losing all of his health at the top lane. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Aatrox oh, still gonna go in. Chains being used and forces the flash out of the Oriana. Go ahead. I was gonna say, uh, weird choice in terms of summoners by uh, Enrique and Rylas. They always take the exhaust, and it makes sense, especially as the game does go on, because. Getting the exhaust off onto a cannon that is slicing Maelstrom through your backline cuts a lot of his damage down. And it is very good for the team fighting. But if you are taking the exhaust in terms of laning prowess, you pretty much forego any sort of 2v2 advantage, especially if you're playing against something like a Lucian Thresh. So in that situation, I don't like that uh, Rylus and Enrique try to actually re-engage and try to get the kill. Unless uh, Kashuma pretty much just runs in, you don't win the 2v2. Because you're always... Oh, no. Engage though from the Gragas finds the body slam the burst of damage and Rika goes down and that's gonna be a second kill over to the Lucian now Rylas forced to flash away from the death sentence to the Thresh but that is still two kills on the Lucian Texas A and M something happened in game three I don't know what it was it was just the sheer fact that they won and everything has just come online they were smurfing for game one and two having a little bit of fun and they are truly just showing up in game five of this series. It feels like Tex A&M just figured out who the carry of their team is. It's not Kirk Coaches. Mr. Black Panda can be the carry, but he's kind of like the secondary. It's Kashuna. He is always the guy that's out doing so much damage in team fights. He's always the guy when you give him a lead, he can carry it out and win the game for your team. And if he is set far, a little bit far behind, or if he's taken to a bad match, he never goes. He he never goes uh down. He always goes even or slightly ahead. And in this game. Five, where it's pretty much do or die. He's coming out super clutch for his team, getting the 2-0 and o lead. And it just feels like Enrique and Rylus is just playing too aggressive. They need to realize that they're not the focal points of the team. That they picked an Ezreal Galio lane that 
They can go even and they can go a little bit ahead, but you shouldn't be ever trying to go over aggressive and they're getting punished. Now, and do note that Nocturne, level 6, out farming the Gragas because he's been paying attention to his lanes in the bottom side. They are going to meet each other, maybe, as Gragas starts his red buff, and currently Nocturne is on the Gragas' Krug. So go ahead and set the camera over there, because that's far more interesting than Ezra clearing the ward. So they're near each other, not meeting yet, but level 6 on that Nocturne means that he could make a play. He's around the corner, waiting in the brush from the cannon. He was pinged out. Okay, so they did actually see him. This ward from Kennen caught sight. Ion's gonna now walk in. They know that ward was there. They know that they saw the Nocturne, so they have to back away. Definitely don't want to make a play top due to the slicing maelstrom, but a play mid definitely could work out, especially with Mr. Black Cannon not having the flash up anymore. He might catch the Gragas in his own jungle here. Anime Lover gonna go in. Mr. Black Panda gonna be in trouble. Doesn't have Flash. Has the heal. Let's see if it's used. Another play opportunity could have been that uh, Aatrox using his ultimate to tank up the turret if he went oh, under it and Nocturne wanted to dive. However, Nocturne pulls off the play of Firefly. Not interested in doing that. Just steals away some Raptors. Heads back into his own jungle as the pressure continues to mount in the bottom lane. Shuna taking a 20 CS lead over this Ezreal. Doing a fantastic job. He is so far ahead, and right now Ezreal's sitting on just the tier plus master soul. He is pretty much foregone any sort of uh, ability to actually lane, especially with Kashuna sitting on the Bilbo Cutlass double daggers. It is so soon. None so will question us. us. They need to be careful of this like Maelstrom. He does have that. Firefly trying to clear out the minions in the back side. Let's see what Kenny can do. There it is. Oh, nicely done. In the meantime, though, the Aatrox is going to get to the mid lane and find the kill. Oh, no. However, he. Oh, the explosive cast from the Gragas a little bit too early. Doesn't send anime lovers backwards. And so now the Aatrox walks away. Tragedy strikes. GMU pick up two clean kills. And again, Eon is the clutch consistent player for their team. He plays so well. Getting ahead in these range versus melee matchups gets the tower dive pretty much solo. Firefly actually didn't even have to come in there and Anime Lover 69 finally being put back on a character he's able to carry with something that can team fight well. Can gets the solo kill onto Mr. Black Panda who didn't have his flash up after burning it early on getting caught by the chains. And again, this game devolves into a point where it's about whether the solo lanes on the side of George Mason can carry harder than the, than Kashuna and the Holy Slurp on the side of Takasayana. Well, I'm sure that we're going to find an answer to that. About a 500 gold lead for GMU at the moment. Join sure, me welcome. And Thank you. Be and Anchor Adore. Thank you for Daker. Uh, Anchor DLF. Thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. Uh, sure, how are you doing tonight? We are casting some amazing Collegiate League of Legends game. This is the best of five. This game is for all the marbles. And so we are talking about that Nocturne now. 80 CS over this Gragas. 50 CS on him. So a pretty big lead. Hold on, we got a huge invade from the side of Texas A&M. Trying to take away this red buff. Firefly sees them. He doesn't have Galio his ultimate team. available. Galio coming in from the side. Red buff is stolen away. Gragas and Oriana walking out together. Thresh here as well to kind of ferry them to safety. Aatrox is looking like he wanted to close. We now see all four members of AM collecting towards the bottom side. All right, they haven't got in just yet. I was wondering if they're going to try to four-man dive the turret or something, but knowing that the enemy members are around the corner, decided not to do so. They don't really get anything except the red buff seal, but again, any sort of pressure that you can put onto this Nocturne is really good. It's good to do. It's just something that you need to do, make sure that the Nocturne can't just keep free farming, can't keep scaling up, because when he does hit that level 11 point where he does have the rank 2 ultimate, that is pretty much the strongest point of a Nocturne. And he can do so much damage, and if he's able to turn this bot lane around, Texas A&M could be in a lot of trouble. Oh, Ooh. Galio goes in. He's looking for that taunt. He flashes forward. He's on two members. Nocturne comes in, but it's only onto the Thresh at first. That means Lucius is going to get the full calling out. In the meantime, Firefly forces a flash. Goes, the Thresh goes and Golden Holy Surge. Still gets knocked oh. up by the J4. Cataclysm's underneath the turret. Doesn't care. And will secure a third kill for GM. You can turn on to the Mountain Drake if they so choose. 
And that's what happens. Again, Eon is oh, able no, to- Oh no, they're trying to collapse onto the Lucian. Hold on. Kushuna gonna be in trouble. The TP from the candle. Let's see if the Lucian will survive long enough. They've been taunted up. The Galio is doing massive work once again, but Gracious has been able to pop one to J4. That means the anime lover should go down, but not before he's able to get to the Gragas to fall. In the meantime, the camera switches over to Mr. Black Panda. Auto ring slowly away on the mid lane turret. This is a bit of a difference. Calm here in the mid lane. Full action in the bottom lane. Mountain Drake secured by GMU and a complete team fight victory. They pick up the two for oh, they pick up the two for two actually. It trades. However, they do pick up the Mountain Dragon early on. They are pretty much splitting almost the entire map here. No towers have gone down. Pretty much even in terms of uh, power plating, except that top side where Eon has taken out three of the tower platings, and again, these team fights are so close. That fight ended up starting out with Firefly diving in with the Nocturnal ult. He ended up actually diving in onto the Holy Slurp, and with that Galio combo, we saw how strong it is to be able to dive that backline, get so much damage off. With the teleport from Eon, he was able to- Ooh, he might kill him. Oh. Oh. Gracious, yeah, just hashtag like no. Proto Bells out. Go ahead, continue where you were with the dive in the bottom lane. They were able to get the dive off because Eon was able to have, he had shoved Crocious into the tower and was able to make the teleport without having any sort of fear of it being cancelled. And by having priority in the lane, he was able to transition it into the bot. But again, that is a, that's such a key thing for lane, solo laners to do when you are having, when you Join have lanes that are far behind, when you have your mob that's far behind, or maybe your mid lane far behind, transitioning the lead that you get into your own lane, Oh, we got another pause. Oh no. This time for Texas A&M. They say, hold up, hold up. We lost our last fight. We got a remake. Just kidding. Just kidding. Let's continue though to discuss where the teams are at. As you've been saying, a good, good, you know, kind of doing their due diligence. Uh, GMU in the top and mid lane before being able to make a play down towards the bottom side. And that's what you need to have in this game five when everything is so important is you need to make sure you do your homework. You get those waves shoved in so that you can TP somewhere else or make a play on another part of the map without being punished. And now they did dive a little bit too heavy, maybe taking the A&M curse of diving underneath the turret a little bit too far, and they lose some members, but they did get a little bit back, and one of the big ones is the fact that this Lucian went down with it, the shutdown gold, as well, to the side of GMU, which is now leading in gold by about that 700 mark. They were able to pick up the Lucian kill, and the big thing to know is how strong Firefly is at this moment. 106 CS to 63, sitting at a 43 CS lead over the Gragas, and he is farmed up. He picked up that Mountain Dragon solo, so he was able to get the that 150 gold, and he does have that Nocturne ulti up, and he might look for this top lane dive with uh, Eon being able to shove that top lane wave, and he... He's probably just going to force the cannon to back off, and they should be able to pick up that top lane outer tower. Yeah, because Gracious minutes. doesn't have TP, he doesn't have Slicing Maelstrom, he doesn't have anything to actually use, so top lane turret, first lane turret, going to go over to GMU. Nicely timed, look at that, exactly at that 14 minute mark when the turret plates fell. So they got full gold from all those plates and the turret on top of it. So now three members of Texas A&M going to try to shove down this bot lane turret and secure it for themselves. It should be a trade of turrets as Galio and Ezreal have backed away, but still, gold slight advantage. For GMU. This is what I like to see the push and pull of the lanes. When you had, when you see the enemy jungler on the top side, you try to make a play around the bot. And good play by Enrique and Rylus not to get caught out and not to overstay here. He might get caught here as on the Oriana. Oriana having to run away at the moment. Nice chain straight into the sweet spot. And he finds the Oriana, finds the shock wave to pull enemy lover back. And that's going to give him just enough time for the Thresh and Gragas to show up as well. Cause Aatrox to rethink his life. Back away. But Rip Carroll spawned at the mid lane because they know that Oriana can't fight for it. So that Shelly should at least knock down this tier one turret in the mid lane. Secure that for the side of the GM. You, as they are wanting to just take everything this game. Two turrets up. Shelly probably going to be stopped before she even gets that charge on the second tier turret. Ooh, almost got it. But good play by Anime Lover to there too. Know that Mr. Black Panda would have a uh, would rotate through. Maybe a little bit lazy on the rotation by Mr. Black Panda. Able to catch him out, and without him being in the mid lane, that is almost that is the entire wave clear for the side of Hex A&M. Able to get that mid lane outer tower, able to get the ritual, able to get the top lane outer, and again, every time we see this push and pull, it looks like we're just, just keep getting a little bit more than Texas A&M do, and it's because of how strong their top side is. Anime lovers 
has pretty much just come back to form. He had such dominant game one and two on that Nico pick. Game three and four, he was put, put into weird picks, picks that we didn't personally think were his style of that. I can make plays, but I can also be really important in these team fights to get a lot of damage off. And with this Aatrox pick in game number five, he's pretty much back to form. He has gone down once, but still doing fantastically. We'll see if that's going to be a key for GMU to actually win this game. Because you can have all the advantages you want, but you can't win the game. can't close it out. It's not going to matter. This is the chat, as well as us, have discussed that Nocturne versus Gragas match at this point. 122 CS to 74 is insane. Level 10 to level 8 for this Nocturne. When he goes in, it's going to hurt. Never laning phase is over. The potential for those combos coming out from GMU are looking good as Galio's making the roams around the map, making sure that everyone has a chance to be potentially ulted by that heroic entrance. And we're probably not going to have to wait too long to see the next team fight as the next dragon is going to be that Infernal Dragon. It's going to be such a huge point for both of these teams to play around because there's a lot of champions on both sides that could use that 8% AD and AD scaling. And Nocturne does have the level 2 ultimate. Hold He's on, Lucian caught. might be able to catch him out. Drops him down to about 200 health. They're gonna go on to Galio, Galio ultimate. They're gonna be kind of wasted. Nice knockback on Viezreal. But Gragas is trying to solo him off to the side. In the meantime, though, the cannon has shown up. Getting a little bit of stun down on the Aatrox. Immediately backs away. The health bars, and m dropping low. Io in position. I think he's already used the Cataclysm. And Texas A and M get out with their lives. But everyone have health. Cannot fight for this Inferno. And it looked like that fight was going to go really bad with Firefly getting caught out there. But again, Anime Lover doing some sort of shy impression. Get so much damage off onto the backline of Texas A&M. Solo on this Aatrox pick. And he's popping off the amount of damage he's getting on. He's able to zone off Kashuna in these team fights, And they pick up the Infernal Dragon 17 minutes. And picking up this bot lane outer as well. And they are sitting at probably a 3k gold lead going into the 20 minute mark. Which is so good. We saw game one, game two. Things are pretty much even all the way through the 20-minute mark. Maybe even into the 25-minute mark when those team fights really started to get truly chaotic. Well, this game five is a little bit different. Advantages for GMU and Texas A&M. They won game three and four. They need to be a little bit resilient, you know? They say, you know what? We're, we're behind this game. We're not doing quite as well as we hoped we would. So, I oh. may be behind you. Hold on. Where are you at? Real quick. 18. Uh, oh, let's cast this first. Hold on. The flash used by Kennen trying to escape as Enrique is going to be going in, getting a little bit of damage down onto Kratos. Can Kennen get out? He doesn't have flash. He's already used it. Can he escape? Gragas is here looking for the barrel to slow them down. Nice dodge with that proto belt. Dodge out in the true shot for Raj. Kennen will live. A little bit of some smashing down going on in the mid lane as that mid lane first tier turret will fall. The Raj is going to get a nice play backwards, though. And Nocturne, not choosing to find a target to go in on will back away. All right, I'm going to count real quick, see if you can match it at the uh, currently 19, 1901, 1902, 1903, 04, 05, 06, 07. All right, we're at the same point. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. I appreciate that as the, the broadcaster things are a little bit slow. Uh, hold up, Rush finds a nice hook down on the anime lover, throws out the, the passage. Aatrox is going to be caught out. Hold on, he's ulted himself. He's healing, but I don't think he's got any chance to escape, but a great pick from the side. Oh. The flash with the calling! All right, Kashuna responds, says, you got the flash, but I got my calling to take you down. Tying up these kills, still down, though. That's about the goal. Great pick by the Holy Slurp to catch out Anime Lover there, and they're, it's going to allow them to get a mid push here, try to see if they can get some sort of damage on this bot, mid lane inner tower. And big thing to note is that while the team fights are going in favor of George Mason, they aren't actually sidelining too well. They aren't uh, sending members into the sideline to pick up these farm, this farm and uh, all this gold that's being just pretty much just dying into the PvE fight. And uh, how I would like the side of George Mason to really play this out is that if you put Ion and Anime Lover on the side lane, they can win their 1v1s. But if you keep Nocturne around the mid side and then him roaming down into either of the side lanes, if you have Nocturne joining in with the Jarvan Cats, or if you have Nocturne joining in with the Aatrox engage, they can win whichever side lane they try to go to. So George Mason does want to keep grouping up, but they don't want to have Anime Lover and Eon in the mid lane too often. 
yeah, that's the thing, is they have to choose when they group well, and they need to be using those champions that can win those side lanes. We talked about the 1-3-1 one, one potential for them. And it, it's a it's a dance. It's a bit of a game to figure out, okay, we're going to send them to clear the waves. We kind of got the J4 in the bottom lane and the Aatrox right now on the top side, clearing those waves, getting a little bit of a push, and then grouping potentially around this objective of the Baron that is live. The next Drake, an Infernal Drake, spawning in a minute 30. J4 walks into the enemy territory, sees the blue buff being taken, decides not to try to do anything as the enemy is around the corner. So Black Panda will get his blue buff. And again, I agree with Eon out here. Oh, they're just gonna go Baron. Oh, they're doing it again. All right, so GMU trying to make a play comes here and grabs the Baron. They've got four members on it. J4 in the mid lane, kind of trying to get bait. They're just sees it. They know that it's going down. The TP in from Ken. Can they take it down in time? Gragas goes in, immediately grabs the lantern out. But that's still gonna be Ken finishing off the TP. And the members of GMU say, Ho hold on, Ken is kind of stuck here. Okay, they have back away, so all five members of GMU will get the Baron and back away. Nice rush by them, and really making A and M pay for their lack of vision. And I kind of figure out what George Mason did. That was the play they made in game number one, and they lost game number three and four, and they were like, they probably forgot that we can make this play. They do the 20 minute Baron rush, and now they're sitting at a sizable 3k gold lead going into this Infernal Dragon fight. A second Infernal Dragon for this team is so strong, and I want to see the engage happen because we have Rylus on the Galio. He has his W taunt flash up. So they can make engages in these team fights, and Anime Lover and Neon are so strong sitting at two items at the moment, with Ezreal hitting that Muramana spike. And keep in mind, this Orianna is not two items yet. She's got the Luden's Echo, but hasn't finished off the Zanya, so she's very susceptible to going down through Shop Barrage. She'll be thrown out by Ezra just to push the mid wave a little bit as they are going to rotate through that Infernal Drake, uncontested by Texas A&M. Lucian has completed two items, so he's a bit strong with the uh, Blade of the Rune King and the Black Cleaver. But really, look at the uncompleted Zanyas on the cannon as well. They need more time to really get those two item spikes. And if I'm on the side of George Mason, they don't really have to use this Baron to get too much. I don't think they should force, to force a fight in the mid lane. They can if they get a good pickoff. They don't need to try and overexert with the Baron pressure here. Just use the Baron to get Swamps to set up the silence and maybe break out that break the inner turret line. And then use that gold advantage, that gold injection you do get from getting all of these three inner turrets down to then push the lead and then secure the next Baron and turn it into that inhibitor slash game winning push. And look at what we've been watching, the Orianna and Gragas sitting around, just actually standing, just doing nothing. That's what you want to see for the side of G. MU because when you're slowly pushing out the side lanes, not taking anything too crazy or too aggressive, you force the enemy team to really do nothing. They have to wait for those waves to crash. They can't fight you. They can't 1v1. You're not grouping as five. So that you just kind of stand around, wait for the wave to crash, hope that you can clear it out, hope that you don't lose too much off of your turrets in the time being. And look at this one, one, three, one. They're just pushing in the waves. They have the Baron buff to pressure the towers just a little bit. I figured but it out. It's not going to be. Ooh, it's the uh, it's the the positives that we saw earlier in the game. Once again, they were consulting the casters. You know, we we have the analysis. They were pausing the game, waiting for the time to tick down, so that they could then check in with the casters, hear what the casters had to say. Ah, oh, <laughs> one three one. That's right. That's what we need to do. And now they are succeeding with that. Aatrox finishing up that signature shirt in the bottom lane. J four still pushing in that top one up there. And I kind of like the Galio chilling here in the mid lane because he can join either one of the sides if a fight does break out. Yep, that's that's the great thing about this composition. Both the Galio and Nocturne can join the side lanes if something does end up happening. And so they, they're able to break this mid and they're, uh, they're able to break this bottom town. They should be able to get this top and they just get such a massive injection of gold. Now they're going to get a 5k gold lead on the side of George Mason. And I think that's good enough. You got three towers with this Baron buff. Just make sure that you get proper vision. You have a, you're sitting on a lot of gold. Go back, spend the money, get more vision control around the Baron, and the next Baron is going to be the one that you really use to break this inhibitor turret one. Exactly. They and I like the choice by them to go ahead and recall. You know what? 
The Baron fell off. There's no reason to do anything crazy. They said, let's we got our bunch of gold. Let's go ahead and complete our third items across the board for our team. The Galileos got the redemption as well. The GA completed by the Nocturne. They're playing it slow and steady. Now, scaling-wise, I still think there's some slight advantage for Texas A&M when it comes to the Oriana and Lucian specifically, because their late game is pretty darn nasty. However, it's really, in those particular plays, oh, that's the red buff reset. Uh, it's really about finding the right fight for them to use the damage, because they're so squishy that if one person bursts them down the Aatrox or the Nocturne, you can have all the damage in the world. If you're dead, you can't use it. I think if, in terms of just a full 5v5 mosh pit, team, mosh pit team fight, I agree that the Oriana M can will deal a lot more damage than the Jarvan and the Jarvan and the Aatrox in sideline. The problem is that the big issue comes in with how does Kasuna deal damage in team fights? With him picking the Lucian, he's such a short range AD carry that he really can't walk up to any of these numbers. Anime Lover, if he's in range of the Anime Lover, will pretty much just flash onto him. And Lucian isn't able to get any damage off in these fights. In terms of Orianna, she definitely can do a lot of zone control with her uh, with her uh, Orianna ball. The problem being is that in the 131, which is how George Mason should close this game out, there's just not enough engage to make that 5v5 happen, and George Mason shouldn't even let that make the 5v5 happen. It's going to come down to positioning and timing, as always, with these teams. As you're getting a little bit of vision on the Baron, making sure that when it comes up in 20 seconds, they are ready for it. They're able to secure the first one very quickly. Let's see if A&M are on top of this one. They know the Aatrox is clearing up that vision, so they know that at least a couple members of... GMU are around the corner. They're looking for it. They have wards. Oh, there's go. Hold on. Galio gonna go in. Nocturne gonna follow as well. They're getting the spear onto the Oriana. Galio ultimate coming in. GA has been popped on Nocturne already. Lucian damage is insane. Zest gonna flash away as well. The J's been popped. Keep that in mind. The threat finding the CC onto the Ezreal. And Crashes is into the back line. Oh, well, the flash from the Ezreal gets alive for the moment. But the anime lover is staying busy. The Galio has fallen. And A and M are winning the fight. They've been picking up the Nocturne as well. They haven't lost a single member. And they can chase this all the way down the mid lane. Or turn on to Baron if they want. And Rike's got no health. He's going to have to back away. I own the only member that's even close to fighting potential for GMU. And here's the problem that we see with these teams. They are so over eager to make any sort of Fresh play. gonna find the play. Hold on, he misses the death sentence. I am walking around the corner. They're still gonna be able to find the kill. More than likely, Zeus chases it in. Relentless pursuit is all he needs to take down the J for that is still giving even more gold over to Texas A&M. They should be able to get the Baron Aatrox around the corner. The members are low for A&M, but a good fight. Go ahead. That's real ulti. Oh, <laughs> Once again, oh I think you're ahead of God. me. He actually finishes off two members, the Thresh and the Gragas. Are you kidding me? Enrique picks up two. They still A&M get the Baron and get the chance to back away. And hold on, Aatrox is going to cause Gracious to uh, try to jump away. I think he might actually go down. Galio here looking for the chop, but I don't even know that it's necessary because Aatrox walks in, finishes off with a slash to the back. Cannon goes down, and out of five members, only two remain with Baron. Talking about the team fight that led to that Baron, uh, to the Baron 3, 3 that's on the side of Texas A&M during the Baron fight. They played way too over eager on the side of George Mason. They tried to engage onto Kushina, but Kushina had all of his flash. He had his heal. Holy Slurp had flash. He had Thresh Box. So there was so much peel on the side of uh, Texas A&M that they couldn't really get any damage off onto Kushina. And afterwards, after the Nocturne dive came in, after the Galio dive came in, they were able to turn it around and they ended up winning the team fight. My big issue is that you know that that was going to happen. You know that Kushino has his flash because he has his heal up. And if you can't pretty much flank him immediately, you're not going to be able to kill Illusion that has a Black Cleaver, has the PD shield as well. In that situation, what George Mason should be doing is that they should be using their ultimates like the Jarvan ulti, like the Nocturne ulti, to just force the flash. You force the flash and you just back off. Mm -hmm. And then the next time you execute the flank, then you get the kill, and then then you get the Baron, and you close out the game very cleanly. Well, then, then go ahead. 
them not going for that play causes the bear to go down, and now the gold is starting to get back to even, and we get to a point where the game is more in flux than it should be. Well, this is the problem when you're a team that's trying to make, quote-unquote, the perfect play, right? You're waiting around for the perfect opportunity to dive and the perfect moment to find a fight. And when you're waiting that long, those spells, like the flash and the heal, come up. And you'd have to burn those before then going in. So you have to kind of do that work initially. Burn your own spells, get the flash back away, and then go back in. At the moment, if you look at the flashes of A and M, all are down besides the Thresh and the members of GMU. You got it up on the Nocturne, up on the Aatrox. There's still some play playmaking potential as the members of GMU are gonna collect towards the bottom side. George Mason seems they can kind of push this out as no neutral objectives up for at least two minutes. And for the side of George Mason, they kind of just want to wait around, wait until this Baron does go off on the two members that they that do have it, the Orion and Lucian. Ooh, hold Lucian. on, fight here in the mid lane. It's Aatrox gonna come in, see what he can do. Galio ultimate going to use that as well. Everyone with the dragon is able to get out for the moment for A and M. Aatrox knocked off the side, but he's already ulting the Orion shockwave. I don't has already been used, but it's not gonna be able Cannon. to do that much. Mr. Peck Panda is gonna be dropped low. The cannon ult in the back line though. He's taken down too. He's looking for the dribble. That's going to be the Galio falling as well. Once again, Gracious just pops off and goes mad. Picking up four kills for the side of Texas A&M. The J4 has to run, but nobody cares. They're going to be pushing down the mid lane. And A&M win the fight again. What a fantastic flank by Crocious there. Such a good Ken ultimate. Almost a four to five man slicing the maelstrom. And they might just look for the end with the Baron buff. Oh, the Baron buff actually runs down here. That's super key. All right, so they don't have Baron, but they still got four members. They're going to be pushing in. I own doing what he can, but the Nexus turret one is getting low. This is going to be a close fight. He drops the Oriana. J4, look what he can. The second Nexus turret is going to fall. It's going to be close. A and M looking oh. to end it all. This is no. game five. Can they do it? They talk to the oh. Lucian. Gracious is trying to oh. auto-attack it down. They can't finish it off. There's no damage on the Thresh. The Nexus survives with a sliver of health. 282 health, but A and M can't end it. This game is going absolutely insane. GMU have 30 seconds on the map with only the Gragas up, but what can they do with an open base? Holy crap, what a close finish. I was counting down the seconds. I was like, Galio's up in three. Can Kushnet end it? And the answer is no, and that is a huge throw on the side of Texas a and they could have just settled for getting the inhibitor, getting some of the Nexus Towers, but they try to go deep, they try to go for the Hail Mary play, which I don't think they actually needed to go for. They get punished for it, and now, with all of them going down, it's going to be on George Mason to get vision around this next dragon that comes up, the next Baron that comes up in a minute. They have the ability, they have a second chance to execute the fight. The fight went so well for the side of George Mason as it started off, but again, they always press a little bit too far. That is the story of these teams. That is the tagline for this best of five series. Everyone pushes just a little bit too far and pushes get such a fantastic success. And I thought that the game was over, but George Mason sticking through it. They are not going down in this fight. And with how strong as well as how strong Aatrox is at this moment, this game could go either way. It's still pretty crazy, but the side of Texas A&M say that your Nexus has a couple of auto attacks. That's all we need to finish it off. So they're not going to do anything about the Baron. They're not going to worry about the Wind Drake that is currently up. J4 even pulled off taking the Wind Drake to try to show up and help defend this mid lane as Supermans are pushing in. A and M have collected as five, but they see all five members of GMU there. They decide, you know what? It's not worth it. Let's back away. Let's head towards the Baron. So they are going to play the bit safe. Oh, hold on. Hold on. The Fanatic Death Brush is GMU going to fall oh, for it. I, I'm oh, actually still price. ahead of you. I'm 34, 44, 34, 45, 34, 36, 48, 49, 50, 51. You. Oh, the answer all good. Hold it, it's dropped everyone low. The shockwave's gonna miss because J4's got all the way in. The GA's gonna work. The slicing Nelson from the cannon is not gonna be nearly as effective. This might be a wipe. A and M are losing to all, multiple members, and I don't even know what's going on. I think my, the game has actually frozen for just a second. I didn't press a single thing. 
We're gonna hold the game on froze for me as well. Oh no, the game froze uh, for both. We're just gonna give no, it a second. Please. We're gonna give it a second. We gotta know how this game ends. We got to know how this game ends at the moment. Looking at this, there it is. The breaking okay, away. That's... It froze a second time. Hold on. They're there teleporting bombs. There it is. Okay, we got three members TP or two members TPing to the bottom side. Ezreal as well as the J4 looking to try to get the bottom lane inhibitor. Kushna alone in the mid lane facing off against the Galaxy. Oh, the and the Androps, he's looking for the kill, but they've got the time. They've got the exhaust as well. The Lucian is down. It's GM. You going to turn it back when they had less than 300 help on their own Nexus. Ion and Enrique are here. Ion is tanking up the Nexus turret one. They're looking for the Nexus turret as well. Zest is on the run. He's Holy the only member alive. There's 20 seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, GMU have ace Texas A and M, Holy and now they're going to win the game. Best of five came down to a single auto attack, and GMU will be your victors for this playoffs best of five. I can't believe the game is decided on one single auto onto the Nexus. Holy crap, what a series from Texas A&M and George Mason. Wow, we I thought the reverse sweep was gonna happen. I thought Texas A&M had that. And we can break down that last push from Texas A&M so many times. There's so many, Factors. it's like the there's so many factors. It's that speech from uh, Avengers where he talks about there's so there's a million possibilities and this is the game that we get. Mr. Black Panda actually had Flash up in that when he died to Ion's Jarvan. If he was able to Flash and get one more auto onto the Nexus. If Kasuno had Flash and gotten one more auto onto the Nexus, the game ends. Then but they're not able to get it. They lose the Baron fight after a fantastic Enrique Ezreal, he actually wiped their team pretty much. They teleport and buy and they end the game. Holy... I don't even know what to say, except holy crap. Just absolutely insane. And even with the freeze in the last team fight, the game itself couldn't handle what was happening. It was just too insane. But huge shout outs to all of these players. This game five has been nuts. And you could tell that everyone was playing the best that they could, putting everything on the line. And when your game comes down to a single auto attack difference between who wins, you know that these two teams were desperate for the win. In the end, it is going to go over to uh, GMU for the win. Fantastically done. Fantastically done. Uh, we got to thank uh, literally everyone, all of you viewers for, for coming in, but most importantly for these two teams for giving us the opportunity to shoutcast this game. Is there anything else that you want to say before we close out this series? That is one of the best best of fives and most fun best of fives I've ever casted. I can't believe that Neither team honestly went mental boom. Game four, it looked so tilting if you were in that game on the side of George Mason. But they rallied back and they realized, this is how we win. This is who our carries are. This is what we do. And neither team, except in game four, I have to say, neither team really backed down from what their play style was. And I think that made it so that the series was so much better because you could see as the games evolved that people were trying some different things. But in the end, it was about George Mason's team fighting comp versus Texas A&M's team fighting comp, and George Mason came out the victors, but God, it was so close. And that ending really defined how close the series was. All right, well, we are going to thank everyone. I'm going to run through the bajillion followers here in just a moment to close it out. But if you enjoyed this, if you thought the hype was awesome, Excellency Shoutcasting casts every single Tuesday and Thursday. Tuesday nights, we have team events where teams, kind of like scrims, but the best of ones, will go up against each other. We pair them off according to their ELO, and they are some hype games. We also have our Thursday nights, which are community free play nights, and we still bring just as much hype and crazy to those matches so if you enjoyed this feel free to drop a follow check us out on discord either way we are going to be that is it for us for tonight i'm gonna thank uh prince for doing a fantastic job casting this is your first time casting on excellency greatly greatly appreciate uh you coming out for that no problem no problem if these games are just as hype as this one i'm i will always be excited to cast for excellency all right well i'll keep you updated